Lecture number 29 on mechanical measurements. We will continue our discussion regarding velocity measurement and in fact this lecture will bring to a close the second module. So, what we are going to do in the lecture today is to discuss further the laser Doppler velocimetry. For understanding the method which uses what is called the reference beam system, we need to understand a little bit about the Doppler effect. And in fact, the Doppler effect is common not, in, not only to optical <coughs> waves, waves, light waves, it can also be used for the ultrasonic waves. So, I am going to generalize the discussion on the Doppler effect, so that we can also look at what is called the acoustic Doppler velocity meter. The common feature is that the theoretical basis is the same for the Doppler velocity meter, laser Doppler as well as the acoustic Doppler velocity meter. I will also discuss in some detail the case of time of flight velocity measurement and also I will look at what is called the cross correlation method of measuring velocity. So, this will form the general pattern for today. Before we proceed with the rest of the thing, let us introduce the Doppler effect and let us understand, try to understand what this Doppler effect is. Suppose we consider a wave. In this case, I am considering for to start with waves uh, which are uh, optical waves or light waves. They are actually electromagnetic waves, which means that the waves have both the electric field and the magnetic field varying with respect to both space and time. The waves propagate with a velocity equal to c, that is the speed of light. And as you know, the speed of light is very large equal to 3 into 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. The fundamental relationship which we are going to make use of is the relationship between the frequency, the wavelength and the speed of light. So, we know that the speed of light c is the product of the wavelength and the frequency. Frequency represents variation with respect to time, while the wavelength represents variation with respect to space direction. So, the electromagnetic radiation will be characterized by as I have shown in this uh, sketch here, the incident wave has a frequency f and the wavelength lambda. And what I am going to do is to look at what happens when a wave is incident on a particle which is moving at a velocity v. In this case, what I have done is deliberately taken a particle which is moving in a direction perpendicular to the incident wave. So, later we will of course, generalize this whole thing. So, we can identify two things, the particle because of its proper the electrical properties, it is going to in general scatter the incoming radiation into all directions. So, we can uh, take a look at what happens in a particular direction, the scattered wave being, being considered in a direction with respect to the velocity vector of the particle, the particle is the scatterer, the incident wave is coming with a frequency f and a wavelength equal to lambda and the scatterer is moving with a velocity equal to v in a direction perpendicular to the incident wave and I am looking at what is happening to the scattering radi scattered radiation in the direction making an angle theta with respect to v the velocity vector. So, let us uh, write the appropriate equations for this case. The first one is of course, the incident wave f, the frequency of the incident wave is the velocity of light divided by the lambda. In case I am applying this equation to a wave of different type, for example, acoustic wave, the c will be the speed of the acoustic waves. 
So, in the, it, this is a general expression, but right now I am just looking at the optical waves. So, C by lambda equal to f is the for the incident wave, the f is the incident wave frequency given by C by lambda. So, let us look at what happens to the wave which is scattered in this direction. The particle is moving, it has another way, it, in other words, it has got a velocity v and it has got a component in the direction of the scattered wave. So, v times cosine of this angle theta is the velocity of component in the direction of the scattered wave. Therefore, the scattered wave is going to move with a velocity greater than the speed of light c, because a certain velocity due to this component is going to be added to that. So, we will generally say that the speed has changed from c to c plus v cosine theta in this case. Of course, if it is in the other direction, it would be negative. So, it could be either the speed can be either higher or lower depending on the, the angle theta. In this case, angle theta is less than 90 degrees, therefore, it is a cos theta is positive. So, I am going to get this one. <coughs> the fundamental observation, which we call as the Doppler effect, is the following the lambda, the wavelength of the radiation does not change. When the speed has changed from c to c plus v cosine theta, the frequency adjusts itself such that lambda remains constant. So, the frequency changes in tune with the velocity. So, we will say that f dash the frequency of the scattered wave which is shown here f dash which is still at the same wavelength lambda is given by c plus v cosine theta that is the velocity in the direction of the scattered radiation because of the additional v cosine theta term divided by lambda. So, we will generally say that the difference between the f dash the scattered frequency and the incident frequency is called the Doppler shift f dash minus f is equal to c plus v cosine theta by lambda minus c by lambda. So, it gives to you v cosine theta by lambda. So, the Doppler shift in this case is due to the movement of the scatterer and it has got a component in the direction of the scattered radiation or I am looking at it in a direction where the scattered direction has got a component of the velocity of the scatterer in that particular direction. Suppose, I look at the wave in the forward direction, the incident direction let us say forward direction theta will be 90 degrees and therefore, v cos theta will be 0. Therefore, there will be no change in the frequency of the radiation as it gets scattered in the forward direction. So, in any other direction if it if it gets uh, I am sorry if, if it is scattered in a direction if it is scattered in a direction for which theta is not equal to 90 degrees that means that the forward wave forward direction is actually theta equal to 90 degrees. In that case, there is no shift in the frequency. The shift is there for all other angles. So, as long as theta is not equal to pi by 2 in this particular case. So, what happens in the general case? In the general case, we have a scattering particle and the incident radiation may be incident on it at an angle theta i. Actually, the entire thing need not be in the same plane. The incident wave, the scattered wave, and so on need not be in the same plane, we can generalize it. Uh, even though I am not able to draw a figure in the three dimensional space, I have just drawn a two dimensional figure. The incident wave is incident on the particle or the scattering particle at an angle equal to theta i, this is the incident angle and the scattered wave I am looking at in this particular direction, I can choose whatever direction theta is and the velocity of the particle is in this direction. So, it has got two components now, v cosine theta s is the component in the scattered wave direction minus v cos theta i is the component along the incident direction. Therefore, there are two components of shift or two Doppler shifts one for the incident wave and the other for the scattered and therefore, the net effect will be a net Doppler effect of v by lambda v divided by lambda into cosine theta s minus cosine theta i. This is the fundamental equation for the Doppler effect. So, what we are going to do is to now look at a laser Doppler velocimeter 
and see how it functions, how it uses this Doppler effect to measure the velocity of a disturbance or a particle which may be present in the flow. If you recall in the last lecture I talked about the fringe system. In the case of fringe system the two beams of a laser which are going to intersect at a focal point of the lens are going to interfere and form a set of interference fringes and the particle which is present in the fluid is going to go across this fringe fish system and uh, gives you a burst signal from which we are able to get the velocity. However, in the case of the Doppler system which uses what is called the reference beam system, we are going to de de determine the velocity based on the Doppler shift. So, the frequency shift is going to give us the information. Let us look at the first reference beam system, describe it and then we will go into the mathematical aspects of it. So, what we have is similar to the fringe system, I got the laser, I got a beam splitter, then the mirror, so that I can create two beams of light from a single laser source, this is one beam and this is the other beam. I call this the reference beam and in this case what I am going to do is, I am going to make the reference beam very weak compared to the scattering beam. The scattered beam is much stronger than the reference beam. That means that the mirror can have a reflectivity which is small, so that the amount of reflected light here is very small. So, I can in other words, I can uh, have a small value for the intensity of this beam which is going through and this is called the reference beam and the reference beam is actually caught by the lens through an aperture and it is communicated to the photomultiplier tube. Now, let us look at the other beam, the scattered beam. The scattered beam is going to come to a focus at the same point as the reference beam and in other words, these two beams are going to come to focus at this point and when a particle or the particle which is moving at the velocity moves through this field, the radiation which is coming from this, this beam gets scattered in this direction and the scattered wave is going to be at a frequency shifted with respect to the frequency of the reference beam and therefore, what the photomultiplier tube is going to see is the reference beam and superposed on that the scattered beam with a slight difference in the frequency. So, we have two beams, the reference beam and the scattered beam with a small shift in the frequency and what happens to this light at the PMT, that is what we are going to look at it. For that let us go to the board and uh, work out what is going to be the net effect on the <coughs> uh, PMT. So, the PMT will or the photo multiplier tube, photo multiplier tube is nothing but an uh, instrument which can be used, which is used to record the intensity of the radiation which is falling on it. Okay, it, rep it uh, just to recapitulate the electromagnetic radiation light is nothing but electromagnetic radiation. It is characterized by an electric field and a magnetic field. This is the electric field. This is the magnetic field. If uh, radiation is passing in this direction, this is the direction of propagation. Suppose that is the direction of propagation, the E and H fields are perpendicular to that. The E and H fields are perpendicular to that. I am uh, just looking at the electric field vector or the H one of the other one or the other. These two are actually going to be involved in inter uh, they, are, they are going to be E and H are not independent, they have a certain relationship between the two and therefore, let us look at the electric field. The energy which is carried by the field, so energy is proportional to the square of the electric field, the square of the electric field and if I calculate the square of the electric field and average over a uh, length of time, 
it gives you the average energy which is going to be carried by the wave. And the photomultiplier tube responds to the energy which is falling on it in the form of intensity. Intensity is nothing but energy per unit area per unit solid angle and so on. So, we need not go into the details. The energy is what the photomultiplier tube is going to respond to. Now, let us look at what is happening in this particular scheme. We have the reference beam. Let us say the frequency is f or corresponding to that let us say f 1 or omega 1 is the circular frequency this is the circular frequency it is nothing but 2 pi times f it is just that I am just introducing this and the scattered beam is at a slightly different frequency because it is scattered by the particle which is moving and therefore, it is shifted with respect to f 1 we will say it is equal to f 2 and correspondingly I will say omega 2 is the circular frequency. Okay. And uh, if you remember what I said earlier this is a weak beam we have chosen it to be weak beam the scattered beam is also weak because even though I have a large intensity beam passing through that uh, focal point only a small amount is going to be scattered because it depends on the number of scattering elements present there and therefore, the scattered intensity is usually weak and in fact that is the reason why I want to make the reference beam weak. So, that I am going to combine two beams which are relatively of the same intensity or same magnitude. So, the total energy this is indicated by the photomultiplier tube consists of the sum of two things. One is the energy due to the incident beam and then I have the so I am going to add two vectors. So, I will say this is E 1 cos omega 1 t plus E 2 cos omega 2 t square of this. This is the instantaneous value I am just squaring the value and this will consist of two three terms E 1 squared cos squared plus two E 1 E 2 cos omega 1 t cos omega 2 t. So, in other words it has got three terms and if you look at what is happening at the photomultiplier tube it is going to not respond to the instantaneous value it is going to respond to the average value and therefore, the if you average this quantity here E 1 square cos over omega t it will give you some small some constant value and similarly this will also give you some constant value. Actually the values are going to be the average value. So, the P m t responds to the mean value. So, that will be given by E 1 square by 2 e 2 squared by 2 and the third for quantity is e 1 e 2 proportional to e 1 e 2 cos omega 1 t cos omega 2 t this can be rewritten as e 1 e 2 cos by using trigonometric relation omega 1 plus omega 2 into t plus cos omega 1 minus omega 2 into t divided by factor the 2 will go off with that. So, this is what is going to happen. So, let us look at what is happening. 
omega 1, omega 2 are close to each other because these are optical frequencies, frequencies of the wave. However, I have got a term here omega 1 plus omega 2 and I have a term omega 1 minus omega 2. This omega 1 plus omega 2 is very large and therefore, this is not going to be the if you take the mean value this is going to give 0. However, this is going to be a modulated signal. In fact, this is called the beat frequency omega 1 omega minus omega 2 is called the beat frequency and therefore, what I will get by looking at the output of the photomultiplier DOV is whenever a scattering particle or a set of scattering particles moves through the focal region, a small a burst of signal will appear and this burst of signal will show you the beat frequency. So, the variation will be modulation will be in the beat frequency. I can figuratively show that like this. Suppose, a set of particles are moving in the focal region. So, the scattered wave will contain a burst signal. The burst signal will have omega 1 minus omega 2 which will be the signal which is going to have before you will get something like this. This is the omega 1 minus omega 2. Remember omega 1 and omega 2 are very close to each other therefore, the difference is going to be a small frequency and this will actually appear as a variation in the in the signal which is given by the PMT. The condition required for this is that the particles should be small large particles will give you will not give you good signal. So, the particles should be small and usually sub micron diameter in size. So, if you look at the for example, the the wavelength of the light lambda the wavelength in the visible part of the spectrum. For example, I have an example uh, the example there were 60, 680 nanometers. In fact, I have uh, numbers in my presentation let us just go back and see if we, if we can look at that. Before we do that let us just look at the specifications of a typical laser Doppler instrument. I have taken it from the website of Canon instrument manufacturer. The measurement range there are two models which they have uh, given in their uh, website Canon LV 20 Z and LV 50 Z. We can look at one of them the measurement range is minus 200 to plus 2000 millimeter per second. So, 2 meter per second is the maximum velocity you can measure focal length of the optics is 40 millimeters the depth of focus is plus or minus 5 millimeters, the laser spot size is 2.4 by 0.1 millimeters, a very small region in which it is going to come to a spot and the volume over each measurement is going to be done is proportional to this. The velocity fluctuation response that means that it responds to 0 to 300 hertz. Let us look at the output signal, the Doppler pulse output is anywhere between 120 to 1000 kilohertz, 120 hertz to 1000 kilohertz this is the upper limit is about 1 megahertz. So, you see that the beat frequency which I talked about is the one we are giving here 120 to 1000 kilohertz. The measurement uncertainty is given by less than 100 millimeter per second is 0.2 and above that it is a 0.2 percent and then the velocity display is 5 digit display and the light source you can see here is a semiconductor laser working at the wavelength of 680 nanometers. And uh, if you work out the characteristic of the laser at 680 nanometers. So, 
the typical numbers for a laser Doppler instrument would be laser wavelength is 680 nanometer, the velocity of light is c is 3 in 10 to the power of 8 meter per second is a universal constant. Actually I have taken the vacuum velocity, velocity in vacuum. The frequency can be calculated as the ratio of c divided by lambda, c is 3 in 10 to the power of 8 divided by 680 nanometer, 1 nanometer is 10 to the power of minus 9 meters. So, I, I do that, it gives you 4.4 .4 into 10 to the power of 14 hertz. So, the frequency is very, very, very high and no instrument, no photomultiplier tube will certainly not respond to this hertz. It is too, too large a frequency to be uh, to be resolved by the photomultiplier, it will only give the average value. Suppose I take theta equal to 0 degrees, the scattered angle is 0 degrees, that means that the velocity is parallel to the direction of scatter 10 meter per second. The Doppler shift is given by, this is just the formula which I have given earlier, F d equal to u by lambda and u is 10 meter per second, lambda is 680 nanometers, you just do that you will get 14.7 into 10 to the power of 6 hertz. So, the frequency of the Doppler signal is going to be 14.7 megahertz, 14.7 megahertz for a velocity of 10 meter per second. So, in the instrument actually the upper limit was 2 meter per second. So, it will be 5 times less than this and that is the value roughly the value which was shown there. Okay. So, the principle of operation of the laser Doppler instrument is that you are going to have two beams of light crossing at the two beams, two laser beams crossing at the focal point of a lens and then one of them acts as the reference beam which is the weaker beam and the stronger beam is going to be scattered. In fact, you can see that the weaker beam also is going to be scattered and the idea is that this amount of scattered light because of the weaker beam is so small that the PMT is not going to respond to that that is the whole point here. So, the stronger beam is going to be scattered sufficiently in sufficient strength, so that you get the Doppler signal riding over the mean value and if you subtract the mean value and look at only the alternating value which is the Doppler value that will show you a frequency which is directly proportional to the velocity as you can see here the Doppler shift is directly proportional to velocity. And you also notice that I do not need any calibration of this instrument. The velocity is Doppler frequency multiplied by lambda. If the lambda is known for the laser beam, that is all what I need to know. Then you measure the frequency of the scattered, the Doppler shifted radiation and all you do is to u equal to f d times lambda. So, very simple linear relationship exists between u and f d and it is a purely, purely, truly linear instrument. So, with this background, let us look at the a tip, it a case of suppose I, I do not want to use uh, laser radiation, suppose I want to use acoustic radiation. Acoustic radiation can be from any low frequency to high frequency. Acoustic waves, instead of being transverse waves, as we saw in the case of electromagnetic waves these are longitudinal waves. Acoustic waves are usually in the form of pressure pulses. The pressure changes as the wave passes through the medium and of course, it requires a medium to be present. And in the case of laser uh, uh, instrument, there was no need, there is no need for any medium to be present. But in the case of acoustic uh, uh, Doppler instrument, you would need to have some kind of a medium present. It may be either a liquid or a gas and the acoustic waves have to propagate through that and then we can use either the there are two, te, two techniques we are going to discuss about either the time of flight or we are going to talk about the laser the Doppler effect. So, Doppler effect and the time of flight. The reason why we can use the time of flight in this case is because the speed of the wave in the medium is usually not very large. In the case of electromagnetic radiation it is 3 into 10 to the power of 8 meter per second is too large. I cannot uh, measure the, uh, the time of uh, time it takes from for it to propagate from one place to another place and then find out the speed of uh, from the speed of propagation find out the uh, the distance traveled and so on it is simply not uh, possible. 
However, in the case of ultrasound wave, ultrasonic waves are usually about 20 kilohertz. A typical figure would be about 100 kilohertz. And how do we produce such a wave? I have just shown a transducer which can be used for that. It is a piezoelectric crystal which is shown here and uh, there is a absorbing material so that the waves are confined to the forward direction, power is supplied to that and a piezoelectric crystal if you subject it to an AC signal, if you subject it to AC signal it gives you pressure pulses, it gives, it gives, uh, it undergoes uh, displacement and uh, if the displacement is confined it is going to, in fact the displacement is going to be going to be communicated to the medium which is next to the piezoelectric crystal and it gets excited. So, when you oscillate the, the electric field to which the piezoelectric crystal is uh, uh, subjected to, you get ultrasonic waves which are going to travel in this direction and in order to make it go only in the forward direction, we have a resin material here, tungsten load resin which is going to absorb the radiation which will otherwise pass in this particular direction. So, only the radiation passing in this direction is going to be used for the subsequent measurement. The ultrasonic transducer can be used both as a transmitter and as a receiver. What do I mean by that? Suppose I impress an electric field, electric, alternating electric field on the piezoelectric crystal, it will uh, it will get excited and it will give ultrasonic waves. However, if I subject it to incoming acoustic wave, for example, some ultrasonic wave is coming and impinging on that, it will give rise to an electric, electrical signal. That means, it is a in the in the reverse direction when the electro ultrasonic ultrasonic signal is incident on the piezoelectric crystal, it will give rise to an alternating current here or if you supply of alternating current here, it is going to give rise to ultrasonic waves. So, the same transducer can be used either as, either as a transmitter or as a receiver. In most of the experiments, we are going to excite the piezoelectric crystal over a very small finite period of time. So, we will generate a pulse of ultrasound wave and this pulse will be used for the determination of the velocity either by the by using the Doppler shift method or by using the time of flight method. Let us look at the time of flight method. I have just indicated a schematic here. So, I have a tube which is carrying a fluid moving at the velocity v this velocity v I can take as the mean velocity ok. And in order to have a sufficiently long length of travel for the wave, I have a long length like this and the inlet fluid is coming here, it travels along this uh, length of this uh, uh, cell and then gets out here. So, that this is the place where I am going to make the measurement. I have got a transmitter here and receiver here and I will call this station number 1 and station number 2, the fluid is always coming in here and going out here. In the second part of the thing, I can make the receive, this the receiver and this the transmitter. Okay. I can change the role of the transmitter and receiver by just driving this and receiving the signal here or driving this and receiving the signal at this line. So, what am I essentially doing? I have the transmitted beam which is going to go through this medium and I have shown a wave which is passing through. This wave is shown with respect to time, it is not with respect to space. So, the frequency is some value of in the forward direction and in the backward direction you can see that the frequency has slightly changed because there is a velocity component in the direction of the propagation of the wave and the value of the velocity when it is moving in this direction is v plus c for the propagation speed. In the second case when it is moving against the stream it is v minus c. So, let us look at the time of flight, the time taken by the wave to travel from the transmitter to the receiver. In the first case path 1 to 2, 1 is the left point, 2 is the right point the wave travels at a speed of c minus v, the wave travels at a speed of c minus v and therefore, time of flight is given by time is nothing but the distance travelled divided by the velocity. So, L divided by c minus v. 
So, this is for the forward path. So, if you look at the path from 2 to 1, the wave travels at a speed of v b equal to c plus v. It is travelling faster now and therefore, the time of flight is equal to t 2 1 equal to l by c plus v. So, if I now form the following, I take the difference between the two speeds, two times, two travel, times of travel or the times of flight t 1 2 minus t 2 1 will be given by l by c minus v minus l by c plus v, it comes to 2 l v by c squared minus v squared, v is the velocity of the, v, velocity of the medium, c is the speed of the wave. And usually in practice, if I am for example, if I am having water in the water as the flowing fluid in the in the tube, the velocity may be a few meters per second. And the velocity of uh, the wave, ultrasound wave is the same as speed of sound, which may be about more than a kilometer per second. It is almost like 1.5 kilometer. Therefore, you can see that I can ignore this portion with respect to c squared and therefore, approximately I can say that the difference t 1 2 minus t 2 1 the difference in the times of flight is 2 L into V divided by C square. In fact, I can also multiply T 1 2 and T 2 1 and you see that I am going to get L square by C square minus V square, which is roughly equal to L square by C square for the same reason, because the velocity is usually very small compared to C square. Now, you see that T 1 2 T 2 1, if I now combine these two equations, if I divide T 1 2 T 2 1 by T 1 2 minus T 2 1, that is what I have done here, you see that I am going to get T 1 2 T 2 1 divided by T 1 2 minus T 2 1 equal to L by 2 V and therefore, the velocity if you you can rewrite it in the terms of velocity as L by 2 into T 1 2 minus T 2 1 divided by T 1 2 T 2 1. So, if I measure the times of flight T 1 2 T 2 1 then I measure then take the difference then I take the product of these two then I can see that I can get the velocity of the fluid simply by taking L by 2 into this particular quantity. What is interesting in this particular expression is that the speed of sound or the wave speed has completely disappeared. So, I need not worry about what is the speed of the wave in the medium, it is not going to come into the picture. So, if I manipulate such that I measure these quantities T 1 2 T 2 1 and I calculate this uh, uh, ratio t 1 2 minus t 2 1 to t 1 2 t 2 1, I directly can measure the velocity. Again you see that v is a linear function of this. L is of course, the distance between the two receiver and this transmitter, which is already known. We can measure it by using a scale and therefore, L is known. Therefore, there is no need for any calibration here. All you do is measure this quantity and then you get the velocity. So, let us look at the situation where such a thing can be used. One uh, arrangement is what is called a clamp on type ultrasonic mean velocity meter. So, I have a transmitter and I have a receiver. Of course, this can become a transmitter or receiver depending on whether I drive it or I use it in the receiver mode and then the flow is taking place here. The acoustic wave is going to travel across like this and when it travels in one direction it is going to be slowed out, slowed down. In the other direction it is going to be speeded up. And therefore, the times of flight are different for the two directions and whatever I discuss, discussed earlier, similar expression can be done for this case also. So, a schematic of an instrument which uses time of, time of flight measurement is shown here. I have the pipe carrying the fluid, I have the transmitter receiver here, another transmitter receiver here and then I drive it by using a pulse generator. The pulse generator is used to drive. So, pulse generator will first drive this and after a gap it will drive this, okay. it will alternate, it will drive this and this alternatively. So, first it will let us say the, this becomes the transmitter, after some time this is going to receive a signal and uh, this multiplexer will look at two signals, one which is coming from the transmitted from here and received here, second one transmitted from here and received here and then it will synchronize with the it will with respect to the pulse generated signal, it will calculate the measurement time. This is all done electronically. If necessary, there can be an amplifier here. So, that the amplified uh, signal is going to be used for the time measurement and from the time measurement, I can calculate the quantity T 1 2 T 2 1 divided by T 1 2 minus T 2 1 or the inverse of that and that is your output and this output is directly proportional to the velocity V. So, the 
time of flight schematic which is shown here requires some complicated electronics, but it is possible to directly measure the velocity and it does not make require any calibration that is the important thing. And the other advantage of uh, the ultrasonic measurement is that the medium need not be very clean, it can be any, it can have even particles, it can be dusty, it can have any uh, uh, for example, air bubbles can be present and so on, slurries we can use, we can measure the velocity of slurries and so on, these are some of the advantages. However, the quantities which you are measuring are really very, very small and therefore, the time measurement becomes very critical. So, time measurement becomes very critical, we will be measuring times scales of the order of microsecond or less and therefore, the time measurement is very critical and therefore, the instrument can be quite expensive because of that. Let us look at one more one other way of doing this. Suppose I have a scatterer present in a medium and the scatterer is moving with velocity u, I can use the similar to what we did in the case of laser Doppler, I can also use acoustic Doppler or ultrasonic Doppler to measure two quantities. In this case, I am going to do the following. I am going to measure the position of the scattering particles, particle by using the time of flight and I am going to measure the velocity by looking at the change in the frequency. F is going to change to F prime. So, the back scattered wave is going to be at a different frequency because it is scattered by the scatterer and the scatterer is moving in this direction and therefore, I can measure by this particular method both the location of the scatterer as well as the velocity of the scatterer, at least the velocity component in the direction of the scattered wave I can measure by using this. So, let us look at the way we are going to do that on the board. Okay, let us look at what we have done there. We have a transmitter receiver here. And somewhere along the this direction, there is a particle or a scatterer which is moving with the velocity equal to u, and I would like to measure the velocity u, and also I would like to measure the distance between these two that is the distance xs. So, at t equal to 0, suppose I say that we have a acoustic signal after some time. I will receive a signal like this. So, this is the transmitted signal and this is the received signal. Okay. What is the difference between these two signals? This of course, is that the frequency is let us say f, this is the f dash. The frequency content of the signal is going to be different from the frequency content here. So, there are two information I am getting. I am getting one measurement of time. So, I will say time of flight and I am also getting. So, I will say time of flight total because it is the, the wave has to travel like this and come back. So, it is actually traveling twice the distance and if you remember what I said earlier f dash minus f is small that is number 1. Number 2 if you look at the speed c, c minus u or c plus u any of these things this is small compared to this, this is small compared to this normally and therefore, the total time taken will be simply given by. So, to, total time taken will be divided given by 2 times x s divided by c, even though part of the time it has travelled a little faster or a little slower depending on the velocity of the scatterer, it is not going to be important from the total, total time of flight itself is simply given by 2 x. So, I can show it as approximately equal to this or x s is equal to c by 2 times t y f total. That is I just measure the time duration 
from the transmitted signal to the received signal and I get that. And now you see that the f dash and f are different and therefore the Doppler shift. So, if I measure the f dash minus f I need to do modulus value it can be either positive or negative and this will be nothing but multiplied by lambda will give you the velocity of the particle. This is very easy to see this is just like what we had in the case of the laser Doppler instrument also. So, simultaneously I can measure the velocity and also I can measure the location. So, whenever such a situation occurs it is possible to use both of them can be measured at the same time. With this background let me take a simple example. So, I call it example 30. So, the situation is like this I have got a tube carrying a fluid whose velocity I want to measure and the transmitter receiver are kept at an angle of 45 degrees. So, there is a transmitter receiver pair like what I showed earlier. So, I may I am going to make the measurement of the time of flight this is d equal to 0.1 meter and we will assume that the fluid velocity is given by 2 meter per second. So, what am I going to measure? I am going to measure T 1 2 that is this is 1 and this is 2. I am going to measure T 2 1. I am also going to measure the and T 1 to T 2 1 these are the products and also I am going to get the ratio which I talked about earlier. So, we will call the ratio tau as delta T divided by T 1 to T 2 1. Suppose I have water as the fluid, the speed of the acoustic wave is given by 1.5 kilometers almost 1498 kilometer per second meter per second and you see that the velocity u is 2 meter per second very small compared to that. It is very small compared to that and in fact I can show that the delta t with theta equal to 45 degrees you remember I already gave the general f i the Doppler shift formula where cos theta i minus cos theta s was there. So, all I have to do is to use that and I leave the intermediate steps to the student. So, it will come out to be 2 d cos theta v divided by c square. The temp difference in T 1 2 and T 2 1 is 2 t 2 d cos theta v by c square and uh, theta is 45 degrees. All I have to do is to substitute that value. So, this will be 2 into 0 0.1 multiplied by cos theta is 1 over root 2 into 2 meter per second divided by 1498 squared and this comes to about 0 0.18 microsecond. The difference in time between the forward path and the reverse path or the time taken by the acoustic wave to propagate in the forward direction minus that in the backward direction is about 0.18 microsecond. That means that our measurement of time must be very accurate. Suppose I calculate the tau for the same case if I calculate the tau for the same case tau can be shown all you have to do is to do the multiplication and so on this will be nothing but v sin 2 theta v sin 2 theta divided by d for this particular case. You can uh, put the uh, values of t 1 to t 2 1 and so on and then get this this will be sin 2 theta is uh, because theta is 45 degrees sin 2 theta is 2 theta is sin 90 is 1 this becomes simply equal to v by d for theta equal to 45 degrees. In fact, that is the reason why we choose the 45 degree angle in this case and you will see that v by d v is 2 meter per second d is 0 0.1 it comes to 20. 
per second. So, tau is a very good indicator because it is a large value and if we can calculate that directly so by using uh, electronics to do that you will get a number like this. And let us take one more example in order to calculate the Doppler shift. So, the shift in the Doppler frequency is given by f, f by c into v cos theta. The Doppler shift is given by f by c into v cos theta. We have already we have seen this earlier and all I have to do is to substitute the values. Let us assume that the frequency f is 10, uh, 100 kilohertz. 100 kilohertz and the speed is again 1498 meter per second. Theta is again uh, in this case I have taken pi by 4 or 45 degrees. If I take that we will see that the Doppler shift is going to be assuming v is 2 meter per second as we did earlier this will be 100 kilohertz divided by 1498 meter per second and v is actually 2 meter per second cos theta is 1 over square root of 2 and this comes to about 94.4 hertz. It is a very small frequency. The Doppler frequency is about 94.4 hertz and uh, if you look at the output waveform you will see the following, you will see this, this is the something like this is 100 kilohertz if I take, the other one will be like this. The other one will be like this, this is the 100 hertz and this is 100 kilohertz. So, the signal will consist of this super, this is superposed on this and therefore, what you see will be like this with lot of high frequency. All I have to do is to remove the high frequency filter out and then I will get the Doppler frequency. So, with this we have looked at two ways of using the acoustic velocity meter. One is using the time of flight, the other one is using the Doppler shift and uh, now let us go back to the uh, presentation where I have another simple method also discussed. This is called the cross correlation type velocity meter with simple in the operation. So, we have uh, the flow taking place through the tube as usual and we have two transmitters and two receivers arranged at two lo locations, one here and the other one somewhere downstream. Suppose a small disturbance is there in the flowing, flowing fluid for example, it could be air bubbles or some particles. The particles will go through this region and after some time it will cross this region. So, when suppose I the transmitter and receiver are always on, so I have a acoustic beam which is going through from the top to the bottom. When the trans, when the disturbance passes the beam, it will give rise to a small change in the signal which is received. Therefore, S 1 will show the presence of the disturbance at some particular time and after some certain time the same disturbance will pass through this region and I will get the disturbance at S 2. Therefore, the disturbance will propagate presumably at the same speed as the same speed of the flowing fluid and therefore, if I look at the S 1 and S 2. I will get the following. S 1 is the signal with respect to time, I get a small blip here, the, vera, the value of the intensity has come down because scatter has passed through the region and I get a blip like this and after a certain time delay tau, time delay tau, I get the second one is going to show the presence of the blip. So, from here to here there is a, suppose I take the product of S 2 multiplied by S 1 
with the t minus t d. So, the product of these two with different time delays, if I take with different time delays, you will see that when the time delay is exactly equal to tau, which is called the correlation time or the cross correlation time, what will happen is that you are going to get a big signal here, big blip here. Therefore, by looking at the time T d, this time T d must be equal to the time it took for the disturbance to move from the first location to the second location. Therefore, I am measuring directly the time taken by the disturbance to move and therefore, it is very easy to see that the velocity must be equal to the distance between the two stations divided by the correlation time tau. So, the correlation time measurement is a very simple way of doing it. Only thing is you require two receivers and two transmitters and a certain length of the pipe in which the flow is allowed to take place and it is possible to measure the velocity. So, with this we are coming to we are bringing to close our discussion on velocity measurement and if you remember we said that the module 2 would be actually considering measurement of fundamental quantities or primary quantities like velocity the temperature pressure and uh, velocity so we have completed that uh, in the set of lectures starting somewhere between 9th lecture 9 and now 29 we have taken about 20 lectures to complete that the module 3 will start from the 